Hi, everybody. Shall we get started? It's about two o'clock here in Berlin on Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. My name is Lisa Onaga, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Third Institute's Colloquium this semester at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Our topic of this year's series is Crisis and Capacity, Perspectives in the Humanities and Social Sciences, which highlights various scholars within and in relation to the history of science. And we're doing this to reflect upon what the pandemic means for doing research right here, right now. And this is especially the case because starting tomorrow, students in Berlin secondary and vocational schools will be obligated to wear masks. And uh, it connects them, uh, gendered knowledges in times of crisis, which we have today. So in our format, we have two special guests. Uh, professors Evelyn Hammonds and Dora Varga. And the idea here is to bring into conversation researchers looking at different parts of the world to help piece together deeper and broader understandings about the role of history of science for making sense of COVID-19 and possibly vice versa. We are recording the talks and the panel discussions uh, amongst the speakers only. I will introduce each speaker for 20, uh, who will each give 20 minute micro lectures and then they'll discuss amongst themselves um, and everyone here will have a chance to listen in. And then that will conclude the recorded part of the session. Then uh, I invite everyone to turn on their videos again and we can discuss together through the Q&A the topic. Uh, um, this will be moderated by co-coordinator Stephanie Hood. And uh, I want to note that there is an Etherpad link where you can queue up for questions. You can write your name there. Or if you want to ask a question and be anonymous, you can write out your question as well. And that link will be provided in the chat. Uh, there's also a useful link within the Etherpad to the uh, uh, Institute's internet library corner where all of the uh, references and the materials um, that are, uh, are being uh, shared by the authors, uh, the, the presenters are being gathered and uh, they're available there for your reference. Uh, if you want to catch up on some things from previous sessions or you want to learn more about things going on today. Uh, but first, before we move on, we have also a brief message from our director, Dagmar Schaefer. So I would like to hand over the the microphone virtually to her. So welcome, Dagmar. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to briefly reach out to you all and also to welcome our uh, two guests, Evelyn and Dora. I'm so delighted to have you in this series. I wanted to be uh, to use this opportunity of the Institute's colloquium probably to, to reach out and think about the situation in which we are nowadays. I think uh, it's very interesting to see that at a point in time when there has been a lot of pressure on people on many, many uh, levels, and a little bit of that pressure is taking off. It becomes a crucial moment of how you actually move forward between, I think, what the speakers of today's um, of today will also bring out uh, between the acute and the chronic that you actually have on different levels of, in particular, the question of gendered knowledge or gendered bodies. The history of science certainly here has a very important role to play because in a sense it has long dealt with the question of both things of gender bodies and gendered knowledge but also the double implications that you have because gendered bodies carry on gendered knowledges the ambiguities of these situations are reaching out to today and i'm really delighted to see that here in the department here in the institute and in the different departments across the departments and with international um, members coming in virtually we have started to think about this situation very critically institutionally as much as on individual levels the directors are very interested in continuing this and thinking about what the practical implications of these things are and we are looking forward to work on this with you together in the coming months but now i will 
stop here. I could say a lot about the wonderful work of those two scholars we are having here today and how great it would be to have them in our conference room, but I'm giving the floor to all of us now to discuss the very important issues that they're laying on the ground. Thank you very much for coming to our Institute's colloquium. Thank you very much, Dagmar. And um, I also want to make a, a, a quick note that um, almost every other week there is a open coffee drop-in for people who would like to discuss these matters also uh, in relation to anti-racism efforts. So please look up for your emails for those. I'm next honored to introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Evelyn Hammonds is professor um, uh, at Harvard University and where she holds the uh, Barbara Gutmann Rosenkranz Professorship for History of Science and uh, is also professor of African and African American Studies and is the current chair of the Department of History of Science at Harvard. And she's the first senior vice provost for faculty development and diversity at Harvard University. And she has also served as the Dean of Harvard College. Along with that, she holds honorary degrees from Spelman College and Bates, and is also a former visiting scholar of our Institute. So in this sense, we welcome her back. Uh, Professor Hammond's career started with her undergraduate training in physics and electrical engineering at Spelman at Georgia Tech with the master's in physics at MIT and gradually turned toward the study of history of science, medicine, and public health in the United States. And the arc of this research uh, that took shape through the PhD process um, at Harvard has been nothing short of pathbreaking for researchers on race and gender and science studies and feminist theory and African-American history. Professor Hammond's long-standing interest and commitment took shape um, to, to understand the confluence of race and gender, in particular, um, the AIDS epidemic. A closer look at her 1999 book, Childhood's Deadly Scourge, which is about diphtheria and the campaign to control it in New York City between 1880 and 1930, shows the historical success of campaigns to immunize preschool children and school children in the 30s. And these campaigns provide an important basis for understanding the intellectual and institutional context to diphtheria's control. And I encourage everybody to, if you have a chance um, uh, and socially distance, go downstairs to the library and uh, take a look at this book uh, so you can understand how Professor Hammonds notes how the complacency about infectious disease control grew as biomedical researchers turned their careers to look at cancer, heart disease, mental illnesses. And it was in that context of complacency about eradication that eradication was completed it pitted infectious disease as an old medicine. And yet that same complacency opened up the reemergence of so-called pre-modern diseases like diphtheria and tuberculosis, as well as making complications for newer diseases, the ability to respond to newer diseases like AIDS. Now, her research has made her a forerunner in the history of science and race, African-American feminism, and analyses of gender and race, especially when dealing and addressing the grave situation in the 1990s, when women of color made up more than three fourths of all cases of women uh, worldwide during the AIDS epidemic, in particular the United States. So her expertise um, as a result of all of this research is widely recognized. Not only is she a, a fellow of AWIS, the Association of Women in Science and the National Academy of Medicine, um, but she's also been in the past appointed to President Barack Obama's Board of Advisors on Historically Black Colleges and Universities and the President's Advisory Committee on High Excellence in Higher Education for African Americans. And has also um, been part of another uh, oversight committee for the NSF. Um, it, it is uh, relevant here to note an important question that she's highlighted in her essay of gendering the epidemic feminism and the epidemic of HIV AIDS in the United States, 1989-1990, which appeared in the book, Feminism in 20th Century, Science, Technology and Medicine, uh, edited by Krager, Lundbeck and Schiebinger. And this question is, is quite relevant and I want to end here 
The question is, how can mainstream feminism address, speak, and act in the name of women who are socially marked and marginalized in different ways by race, class, sexuality, and disease? And so it's, it's with this work that is uh, intersectionally examining science, uh, medicine, and social, sociopolitical concepts of race um, in the United States that's been very well recognized and also underlying the topic of the micro lecture today, COVID-19 and the racialization of mistrust, where she'll be talking about the challenges of, of developing vaccines and the reasons why it's very difficult to include African-Americans and Latinx people in clinical trials at the moment. So thank you for joining us so early this morning from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Professor Hammond. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a wonderful um, introduction. And thank you to uh, Dagmar. And I, I am happy to be here even virtually. <laughs> I uh, truly enjoyed my time when I was at uh, the Max Planck and looking forward to uh, coming back in person sometime to, um, to enjoy the, the great community that you all seem to create there. Um, so um, so thank you for this, and it is, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk about a paper that um, um, my colleagues Susan Reverby and I started working on uh, as we sort of march through a number of issues that continue to explode and gain great visibility throughout this um, pandemic. Uh, I guess we're now in the 11th month as we've dated so far in the United States. Um, and it's a, it's a critical period politically, socially, culturally, with respect to medicine, science, and public health as well. So what I want to do this morning is talk about this, this, this new work that, that we're um, uh, doing on the racialization of mistrust. And so I'll, you know, I have some remarks, I'll, I'll read some of them, and then hopefully we'll, we can talk through some of the points that I'm making. So as the pandemic of COVID-19 continues in the United States with a terrifying increase in cases and deaths, including as I looked up the numbers this morning, 11.3 million cases and 247,000 deaths. It's, it's almost, uh, it's, it, it, it's almost, it's difficult to even say that those numbers. Uh, and I think the sort of enormity of, of what we're, engaged in right now is still sort of slowly but surely coming into um, coming into view for many, many people. Uh, so in the midst of this, this striking increase in this surge we're having right now, um, attention has certainly turned to uh, the development of vaccines uh, against this deadly disease. Yet unlike in previous vaccine trials, which were overwhelmingly populated with white Americans, public health leaders, medical researchers, and pharmaceutical companies are struggling to enlist African-Americans and Latinx individuals into clinical trials for the new vaccines. However, to date, only small percentages of African-Americans are participating in these trials. The reasons offered uh, by media and health experts focuses on what has been called the long-standing mistrust of African-Americans of the white dominated healthcare system. And so what I wanna address this morning is the consequ consequences of the racialization of mistrust for the control of COVID in the United States. So I wanna begin just noting the sources of mistrust that have been identified. So when it became clear this spring that black Americans were among those disproportionately affected by COVID, Physicians, public health experts, and journalists offered a plethora of reasons for why this occurred. And some pointed to pre-existing comorbidities among black people. Others fell back upon unproven genetic differences. Others focused on educational and economic disparities, and especially the difficulty poor African-Americans faced in social distancing if they lived in crowded housing or worked in public facing essential jobs. And lastly, it was noted that African-Americans lacked consistent access to good healthcare. But over and over, however, almost every analyst or, um, I'm sorry, an analysis or commentary 
noted that African Americans had a higher degree of mistrust than white Americans of the healthcare system, which, which is now extended to mistrust of vaccine trials. So no media stories or recent research articles noted any mistrust of vaccine trials or resistance to public health mandates among whites. And I hope we can talk about this uh, later in our discussion. The rationales for the mistrust of African-Americans pointed to the legacies of three events in United States history. First is the surgeries on enslaved black women by white Alabama physician, J. Marion Sims in the 1850s, which he conducted without anesthesia and without their consent. The second is the US Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in, uh, known as the Tuskegee study, where from 1932 to 1972, hundreds of black men were used to research the effects of untreated latent syphilis. And the third is the, is, um, the use of the cells taken from a black woman, Henrietta Lacks, to produce the longest surviving cell line used in much medical research. So as a historian of science and, uh, and medicine and public health, um, along with my colleague, Susan Reverby, we've been interested in trying to understand why these three historical episodes have become so iconic and why they're referenced as the basis of mistrust among African-Americans today. Um, and though we both published and taught on the history of racism in American healthcare system uh, for decades, neither of us would deny uh, the importance of these historical events. In, in, indeed, uh, my colleague Susan Reverby um, has worked on the uh, successful uh, apology that Bill Clinton gave to African Americans because of what happened uh, in Tuskegee uh, in 1997. But we argue that it's not simply knowledge of or even just rumors of these historically infamous studies that lead to mistrust among African Americans of clinical trials, vaccine studies, uh, government inducements for medical information, or the healthcare system in general. Rather, it is the fact that deeply flawed ideas and practices about the meaning of race, unexamined assumptions about racial differences and disease, and the ways in which these ideas have become naturalized in medicine and public health in instances of everyday racism and systemic and institutional racism that is producing this racialization of mistrust. And by racial, racialization, I mean just the process of ascribing racial labels to social practices that were not previously identified as racial. And we see that, that clearly operating here. When and being enlisted in a clinical trial is something that was never racialized uh, previously. But repeatedly is something about this increasingly distant past of various horrific and infamous medical cases involving the exploitation of African-Americans, uh, especially the work done by Sims and Tuskegee. So it's those rather than the now that is driving discussions, arguments, and even education about the fraught relationship uh, between African-Americans and the healthcare system. So as we face what is becoming a crisis over clinical testing for COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, disease, and also for the uh, trials for the vaccines, there are real limits to relying on these historical episodes to explain mistrust among African-Americans. So some researchers have described something, this thing we call trust as uh, quote, an expectation that medical care providers, that's like physicians, nurses, and others will act in ways that demonstrate that the patient's interests are a priority. In this sense, it is a kind of a multidimensional construct that includes perceptions of the healthcare providers, technical skills, their interpersonal skills, the extent to which the patient perceives that his or her welfare is placed above other considerations. But such an articulation of trust as an individual's reaction to personal encounters with healthcare providers 
does little to capture Blacks, African Americans, personal experiences of racism. Therefore, observers who are pointing to past historical studies and episodes of Blacks' exploitation by white physicians and researchers does not explain much of anything other than to acknowledge some kind of sort of quick uh, um, attempt to talk about cultural competency, to express a certain kind of cultural competency about Black anger and pain uh, over medical and public health neglect. So it fits within the limitations of knowing a little bit about history uh, and, and a little bit about the culture uh, that somehow supposedly is supposed to overcome bias and overcome stigma to create communication skills that, will, that should link patients um, and their providers. But real issues of structural racism within healthcare uh, are hidden when you talk about Sims and Tuskegee, the 1850s and the 1930s, uh, and, and they're being invoked just as learning in the same way as uh, clinicians just learn a few words of Spanish so they can communicate with the, with the Spanish speaking patient. And so I want to turn, uh, and so th by doing so, I should say first, uh, makes these researchers and practitioners think they're competent in understanding racism, uh, but in, indeed what we argued that it does not. So let me now turn to just a short reminder about one of these historical uh, experiences. Um, and the first, and, that, and the one I'm gonna choose is the US Public Health Service study of Tuskegee, just to, for those of you who don't know any of the details of it. So Susan Reverby is one of the leading historians of the Tuskegee um, study. It is um, the, the, Uni the United States Public Health Service was concerned in the early 1930s with both the extent of syphilis in the United States population and the questions over the efficacy of the heavy metals um, that were then used for the treatment. So they started a, a research project in and around Tuskegee, Alabama. It's a small town in Southern Alabama. Uh, to, and they wanted to see if lack of treatment made a difference in syphilis morbidity because they were concerned about the treatment using heavy metals. They chose only African-American men for the study because they thought that the disease was more common in blacks than in whites, than in black men, than in white men and that the complications of the disease also vary by race, even though the data to support these scientific understandings were fraught with errors. They rounded up approximately 600 men, 399 supposedly in the late latent stage and therefore no longer contagious, and 201 controls without the disease. They deliberately lied to the men and told them that they were being treated for their bad blood which was just a colloquialism for syphilis. Um, they promised that the diagnostic spinal taps that the men were given to test for neurological complications were a special kind of treatment. They left out women over concerns with congenital uh, passage of the disease, even though technically everyone in the study was supposedly non-infectious. The study went on for four decades, 1932 to 1972, through the discovery of penicillin, which was, which was shown to be a cure for syphilis, and through the civil rights era. So dozens of reports were published about the so-called volunteers, as these men were labeled sometimes, even after questions about the ethics of the study were raised for decades. Finally, a sexually transmitted infectious disease investigator at the Centers for Disease Control, um, uh, who was not connected to the study, told the story to a journalist and it hit the media in July of 1972, which resulted in a federal investigation, a Senate hearing, a lawsuit, uh, and pressure to elucidate rules for ethical experimentation followed. Uh, revealed at a time when other unethical studies were coming to light uh, done by responsible, so-called responsible and respectable prominent research physicians, uh, it was found that Tuskegee was not exactly an outlier. 
But within a few years, there was a federally sponsored report known as the Belmont Report. It's a very uh, important report for the study of bioethics in the United States. And it laid out what became known as the common rule for ethically responsible research. The study also lived um, in the land of rumors. The biggest one that started almost as soon as the first news report about the study was that the men were given syphilis by the government. This idea still flows through our culture, showing up from time to time, and most recently, as I counted uh, last week, at least 12 news, story from, news stories from around the United States still reference that point. It shows up in sermons, it shows up in um, all kinds of news stories uh, on Twitter, Facebook entries, etc. And so Tuskegee has taken off as a metaphor for fear of racism in medical care and can be found also in songs and poems and even a Saturday Night Live routine. Uh, it became a shortcut, uh, even a meme of sorts to explain racism but other than a label said very little about what constitutes racism. Just as AIDS took hold in black communities at the end of the 1980s, health uh, educators noted that memories of what happened at Tuskegee uh, also was a reason that African-Americans did not trust the government's interventions on, on HIV. So over the nearly 50 years since this study was revealed, it continues to be referenced sometimes with questionable data, other times without any, to explain, even before COVID-19, why African-Americans distrust the healthcare system. And Tuskegee itself has become this kind of flexible symbol available to be used and abused, as one of our colleagues um, said, um, to serve all kinds of, of explanations, both intellectual, medical, um, and cultural. So now let me turn to something we, we, talk, we call everyday and systemic racism. But if systemic racism in medicine and public health is taken seriously, it is the disrespect and dismissal um, experienced at an individual's last medical encounter or the treatment of a family member at a nursing home that builds up a lifetime of racist experiences that matter in creating distrust. We're arguing that distrust is a cumulative output from a lifetime of racist experiences. And it is this cumulative, um, cumulative impact of everyday racism, which was uh, we took from Philomena Assad's work on everyday racism, that works across race and class, undergirding our racially stratified society, including the lack of decent housing and education, lack of reliable transportation, limited sources of nutritious food, lack of access to safe places to exercise and um, enforce pover poverty that has proven over and over to create disparate health outcomes. And despite generations of medical and public health practices that sustain what I call the logic of difference, which the logic of difference produces a racialized black body that's made up of black bones and black hearts and differences in, in lung capacity or genetic variants that only appear in black people. And, it's, and they produce disparities and, and research uh, that has demonstrated the structural creation of black health. So this racial, racialization of the black body is connected to structural inequalities that also produce black health. And this link, um, so I should say, the link that has to be made between an explicitly racist past and commonplace practices of today. So let me say that again. The link that has to be made is between an explicitly racist past and commonplace practices of today. So although this is not the intention, invoking these now iconic studies from the past also labels those who acknowledge them as looking backward to some distant worry that should not affect a more modern people now. So some researchers are arguing, why do, these black people, why do black people continue to reference something that happened in 1850? 
Well, why do they keep referencing something that happened in 1932? Um, and and it, the, 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 the inference from that is that these things happen so far in the distant past. We are not, whites will argue that they are not those people who did those things anymore, right? And so it makes it seem as if changes, when people reference these, uh, it is argued that it makes it seem as if change is not possible because this burden of history cannot be overcome. So we argue that these historical studies do matter, but they matter for what they show us about what is happening now, not just what was done in the past. So examples like the Sims case in Tuskegee and other cases like them, they matter because they lay bear the underlying flawed science of racial differences. And racial differences in life experience matter currently as the political upheaval that we've been experiencing all summer has demonstrated. So including a historical perspective that can tell us where we have been, <coughs> excuse me, and how we as a nation have failed to incorporate lessons from previous ep epidemics that reveal the role of systemic racism in perpetuating health, health inequalities is really critical. And I wanna end just by the point that was made by physician and public health expert, Jack Geiger, nearly 20 years ago when he wrote that history is important because it underscores the extent to which racism fluctuating in intensity, shifting in content, but ever present is still a major public health problem and a challenge to the goals of medicine and science. And he continued, the failure of efforts to address racism reflects an abandonment of racial justice and equity as national goals, and it's not just history. So thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Hammonds, for that illuminating talk. And and I think it's uh, great fodder for discussion. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of things to discuss and talk about. Um, at this time, I just wanted to, while in between speakers, mention a few people who are working behind the scenes that we would like to thank who are making um, the, the Institute's colloquium possible as well. Uh, Verena and Aaron, who are doing a lot of the work um, to help produce these videos. So if you're worried that you missed some previous videos of the Institute's colloquium, you can go back uh, and check out the, uh, the YouTube channel um, and the links I think will be provided in, in the chat. Um, so please feel welcome to look at those. So next, I am equally honored to present our next speaker. Uh, Professor Dora Varga is senior lecturer based at the Department of History and the Wellcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health. And she's previously held fellowships at the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities at Oxford and Birkbeck University of London. And I should also add that coincidentally, we, Today we have two alumni of the Institute. Um, Dora Vaga was also a pre-doc fellow as I understand. And so in this sense, welcome back. She's also co-editor of the journal Social History of Medicine and has a, a, a great pulse of what is happening right now in the field. Her work spans from the politics of epidemic management to public health systems and access to therapeutics. And so I think that connects to uh, some of the issues raised earlier. She has written on the global infrastructure of diphtheria antitoxin in particular, which uh, relates to how vaccine stocks were created and how uh, in the face of re-emergence of, of these diseases, uh, how the world was prepared or not prepared. In particular, her work has looked at the politics of vaccination in the Cold War and hospital care of disabled children in communist contexts as epidemic narratives shift in historical analysis. To that point, her monograph, Polio Across the Iron Curtain, Hungary's Cold War with an Epidemic, uh, published in 2018, which you can also see in the Institute's library downstairs, has received the biannual book prize of the European Association for the History of Medicine and health. And the significance of this book's intervention really holds 
right now, ever more. Uh, this book shows that disease agents do not care about the politics of humans. And in fact, there's a way to write about history of medicine and history of science that sets aside a bit the parameters of the politics and shows how there are different arcs, different temporal arcs and bookends from uh, that trace how the histories of disease occur. One of the research inquiries that also emerged from that work, which you can also check out through the virtual library, uh, is this discussion of the absence of the so-called poster child, the pictures of, of children who are afflicted with polio uh, in Hungary do not really exist compared to other countries with similar situations. And that was a big question that was also explored in the context of pronatalist communist state ideals and how the uh, efforts to return children's health to so-called normal health in the face of eradicating polio also uh, dovetailed with the dismantling of treatment centers that made patients and their parents less visible. Recently, Professor Varga has been working on a project titled After the End of Disease, and this places epidemic narratives in focus uh, through inter interdisciplinary collaboration. And it thinks about the conventional narrative and the sort of epidemic bell curves and so forth to identify cults and disseminate different understandings of disease and their impacts. And that work um, is also complemented um, with a new project called Socialist Medicine supported by the European Research Council and the Wellcome Trust, which explores global health histories from the socialist world's perspective. So we expect to see a lot of exciting new uh, uh, research coming out from uh, Dr. Varga's uh, 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 research program. And today we look forward to the talk, Acute and the Chronic Temporalities of Medical Authority in an Epidemic. So welcome, thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous um, inter uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be back, um, if only uh, <laughs> virtually this time. Um, hopefully that uh, that uh, can change in the future um, when the epidemic is, is ended. But um, this is exactly what I would like to talk about. And it, I realize now how it sort of dovetails on um, Evelyn's um, talk about using past and, and current uh, um, issues that are disconnected and disjointed, but also um, very much um, uh, are coherently uh, connected. So I'll, uh, I'll speak a bit um, about how I've been, what I've been thinking about the epidemic uh, narrative that, uh, that we're living through and how we construct those stories and what the stakes are of that um, in more broadly. Of course, one has to mention here um, Charles Rosenberg's iconic article titled What is Epidemic? He published this in 1989, where he laid out an overall structure of dramaturgy in epidemics in history in order to address the contemporary crisis of AIDS um, in the late 80s. So he famously sketched out a course of epidemics in three acts, an increasing and revelatory tension, uh, followed by an individual and collective crisis, and then a drift towards the inevitable ending. Just over 30 years later, um, in the middle of another epidemic crisis, perhaps it's time to that we look back again and uh, see and reassess um, uh, some of these uh, uh, narratives and temporalities. Charles Rosenberg's work has been recently placed in, in re renewed focus, um, partly because of the enormous impact he has had on the history of epidemics, um, but also because he engages with these um, uh, narrative aspects of it. And uh, this has not, not only come up right now, but um, um, people have been th uh, thinking about this, most notably Catherine Kudlick, um, who called for a new epidemic script by integrating um, issues of disability and disabled actors and problematize the focus on survivors and what that erases and, and places uh, in the uh, continuity. And I have argued um, for the reconsideration of the epidemic narrative by placing after the end into the focus of analysis through the case of polio, some of which um, I will talk about um, right now. 
and there's, you know, we have a direct experience of the global epidemic and new, new uh, also new directions in historical research and academic temporalities. So um, I'd like to take a bit more thorough look, um, not just, you know, what happens after the end of disease, but what is happening um, during an epidemic. So Rosenberg presents an overarching structure to epidemics, highlighting their episodic nature and distinguishing them as events um, confined to time and space. There is a narrative arc that epidemics share um, from a slow beginning through a crisis point to this whimpering end um, which, uh, in which social responses to a particular disease are formed. There is tension between the seemingly universal and the unique here. Um, Rosenberg points out that epidemics at once adhere to a pattern which she explores as dramaturgy and at the same time, and I quote, the pe peculiar texture of any epidemic reflects continuing interaction among incidents, perception, interpretation and response. So it's once, uh, epidemics are once, uh, at once static and dynamic, following a set storyline, but dynamically changing all the time. I see this tension working in the epidemic narrative arc itself. Narrative is always retrospective and at the same time creates it continuously in real time as the epidemic happens. We pinpoint the moment where it all began after the epidemic has already um, been acknowledged and very visible um, and uh, forceful enough to elicit this kind of social and political response. We cannot know if we've reached the crisis point until after it's over. We don't know if it's you know, still going up or um, starting to go down <clears throat> and we'll not know for some time if more epidemics waves of weight, quite possibly for years. At the same time, however, thinking in an epidemic narrative is a continuous process, very much focused on the present. It's happening real time as epidemics unfold and answers are thought. It's a sense-making process that creates the stories we tell about our own experiences as they are occurring. For want of better tools, the new uncertain and unexpected in an outbreak, both as created as real time and retrospectively, is often framed by the imagined of a real dramaturgy of past epidemics along seemingly stable models. The contemporary and the past are then inextricably linked and continuously shape each other. The dramaturgy is therefore extremely important as ideas of past epidemics and how we piece together their narratives matter greatly. The past is what our experiences and responses are anchored on. Invocations of battles and heroically um, fought wars, outbreaks of the Black Death and the Spanish flu are all regularly pulled out from the academic realm to serve as explanation, guidance or inspiration for the inexplicable, unplanable and sometimes unbearable. Epidemics are dramatic as uh, Rosenberg rightly point out, but the various temporalities at play do not necessarily map onto any dramaturgic form, nor on the narrative of the bell curve. Urgency, emergency, and permanence coexist, and at times are conflict with each other. As we reconsider the ep epidemic dramaturgy, we need to take into account not only the act, but the scenes and the dialogues as well. Polio is fitting the lens to examine these various temporalities. This disease, which swept through the globe in the early to mid 20th century and manifested severe symptoms in only a num small number of infected people, so I don't know if you see the kind of parallel here, causing potentially long term and life changing effects, provides useful entry points uh, for analysis in relation to the current COVID 19 crisis. The urgency of treatment regimens and vaccine development, the emergency of respiratory paralysis. The impermanence of debilitating effects concurrently shape the experience and responses to the out epidemic outbreaks. Each aspect carries within itself temporal shifts and overlaps within the dramaturgy of polio epidemics. Crisis points emerged consistently. The treatment of polio, respiratory care, surgical interventions, and physiotherapy intersected with dynamically changing notions of urgency, emergency, and permanence. In this nexus, children, parents, nurses, physical therapists, and island patients played crucial roles in creating, negotiating, and maintaining medical knowledge and care. The emergency with which solutions um, in ventilation had to be found for respiratory paralysis did not change or subside with the passing of the peak of the epidemic wave. While iron lungs were the technologies of acute care mostly, they were also costly, rare to come by, <clears throat> and logistical challenge to move around, or to keep in large numbers for non-epidemic months and years. 
More importantly, however, iron lungs and other respiratory devices also became instruments of chronic care. A relatively high number of patients who survived needed long weeks, months, or even years to be separated from respiratory technology, while some remained unable to breathe without assistance of machines permanently. Iron lungs thus were situated in an interlocking tension between the emergency of the life-saving and the permanence of life-maintaining, in which crisis points were constantly present and in which an endpoint never arrived. New patients would arrive with a world of urgency to soon join the permanent stability of others in respiratory wards, life punctuated by emergencies created by power outages, faulty equipment, or infections. The dramaturgy of lifetime itself would also be questioned. Not many health professionals expected children in iron lungs to survive for long. And when they did, their extended childhood into teenage and adult years contested established frameworks of the life course and it became particularly acute uh, in questions of sexuality, for instance, as these children were cared for um, by the same people in, the, in a kind of permanent childhood, in a way. From respiratory patients' perspective, urgency, emergency, and permanence layered onto each other in ways that makes a narrative epidemic arc difficult to apply. Temporal tensions did not only concern uh, patients, though. Polio and the peculiarities of its treatment process impacted medical fields and hierarchies as well. The emergency of ventilation and critical care prompted medical expertise in anesthesiology to emerge from the operating room and take central stage in patient treatment. Famously, anesthesiologist Ibsen and epidemiologist Lassen, uh, Lassen's collaboration in the 1952 Copenhagen outbreak led to new interventions in respiratory technology and eventually led to the establishment of the first intensive care units. At the same time, urgent uh, acute treatment and lengthy rehabilitation interconnected through gendered notions of care placed by the medical authority of women, notably nurses and physiotherapists into focus. Naomi Rogers had explored exhaustively the politics surrounding uh, nurse Sister Kenny's methods, which were groundbreaking in polio treatment, upsetting existing medical and gender hierarchies. Similarly, physical therapists, overwhelmingly women, became key in the extended rehabilitation of the um, uh, process of polio and could on occasion override the judgment of male surgeons and as the success or the need for surgical interventions depended greatly on months and years of physical therapy sessions. The case of polio demonstrates clearly that coexisting temporalities below the epidemic arc tug away at the overarching narrative. While they don't necessarily shift or shatter the dramaturgy as a whole, we need to consider them as various ways in which time is experienced and narratives are weaved from seconds, hours, weeks, and years may have um, a significant impact on the act actors on the stage, their actions and contributions to the overall play. The dramaturgy of epidemics uh, is so is um, not to be dismissed. The narrative of beginning crisis and, and serves a threat to organize experiences and expectations around. It is a seductive narrative that pulls us in with its familiarity. In an, like an all too familiar play we read and performed in school, watched in theater, and also seen the film adaptation of, there is comfort in the recognition of the overall pattern. To bring another metaphor into the mix, just to, to raise confusion, it's like being on a roller coaster. We brace ourselves on the way upwards, the epidemic bell curve, prepare medical, emotional, social, political, and cultural responses to the worst that is yet to come, knowing that a download slope awaits and that eventually the ride will be over. It is important then to be conscious of, this, of the work that this narrative performs and in turn to question its assumptions. The process of an ending fuels treatment and vaccine development, eradication programs, and provides hope and coping mechanisms for societies and individual epidemics, individuals in epidemics. The narrative arc is also an escape uh, from the suspended time or even timelessness of the epidemic crisis, providing a structure to an unstructured temporal existence, which is at the same time uh, is filled with temporal tensions, as we saw. But the seductive the nature of the narrative is exactly its trap, providing a relatively neat framework that does not necessarily accommodate the multiplicity of epidemic experience. 
Epidemic endings messiness or outright impossibility may render certain actors invisible or push them out of the narrative or create frustration, inequalities, and might entrench severe public health problems. Epidemics are episodic events, as Rosenberg reminds us. In between waves might come relief, a conscious forgetting of epidemic times, celebration and recovery. But the episodes are often connected by the lives of victims' families, recovering patients, fears of a new outbreak, infrastructure established in crisis moments. There's an underlying continuity and persistence that carries forward episodic moments long after they pass. In some cases, specialized hospitals or wards continue to operate, as was the case in between polio summers. Vaccination campaigns upheld by reminders of outbreaks past and references to potential new ones in the future. This continuity is upheld for a while, even after epidemic waves cease to return. The structures that have been bound to the events that happen no more disappear or transform sometimes with tragic consequences for members of society for whom the epidemic is far from over. To give you an example, in 1963, four years after the last polio epidemic in Hungary, the specialized hospital closed its doors to polio patients and was transformed into a general pediatric hospital. For most patients, this meant the loss of access to technology, expertise, and medical files uh, of their past interventions, all of which was needed in their continued treatment as they kept living on with the disease, the epidemic that was no more. So this, in this way, epidemic endings, the epidemiological, the political, the social, and the individual moved in different dimensions. What happened to, happens to medical knowledge after an epidemic is a further important question. As the urgency of the national engagement passes, governments, global health organizations, and medical establishments shift gears. With a low or even non-existent priority, infrastructures wither away, training and certain skills is seized, intimate knowledge of surgical techniques, therapy sequences, personalized medical equipment disappear from its original repositories. With polio care no longer taught at medical schools, patients became the sites of medical knowledge of their own condition. This was not necessarily a significant change or an active process of transfer. The participation of patients in their own treatment was seen as key in polio care. This could result in children actively being involved in and sometimes shaping their treatment options from the type of surgery that most fitted their aspirations down to the pressure settings of iron lungs. With the disappearance of institutional care, parents and children then had to work out and research the systems of medical care and knowledge that was indispensable for maintaining physical capabilities. In their continued treatment growing up, they had to then negotiate medical authority with physicians, surgeons, and nurses who no longer possessed the knowledge and skills needed. There are other examples of other epidemics when this knowledge, transfer of knowledge from medical professionals to patients is more evident and mostly out of necessity, an intended process. A more recent example is Zika, which caused babies to be born with microcephaly often in remote locations without access to regular medical care and therapy that is needed for the survival and the development of the children. In Brazil, with this in mind, many mothers were trained in specialized care to enable them to independently care for babies that healthcare systems were not prepared to provide for. They would have had to travel for days to get um, uh, therapy sessions, for instance, for the babies. So the solution to that was to train the mothers themselves to give that care. Many of these women were single mothers abandoned by their partners or in situations where the partner was not able to take on the financial, physical, and emotional burden of a disabled child. This then put disproportionate economic and personal pressure on women for many years to come, with Zika no longer being a concern for the Brazilian government or in global um, health organizations, the remaining support systems also withered away. What I described above is different from an afterlife of an epidemic, the lasting impact or lessons learned, as uh, uh, which Rosenberg points in uh, his brief discussion of how epidemics end. What I argue for is a reconsideration of how we understand epidemic endings in their multiplicity and performative work. The end of an epidemic is, um, as Rosenberg writes, flat and ambiguous, like inevitable sequence for a last act. But where and when does that last act finish? Is an ending to an epidemic always inevitable? Who and based on what makes the decision to announce the ending? And what can be the ending, uh, the consequences of such declaration? 
Polio then prompts us to reconsider the epidemic dramaturgy in its acts and scenes. It uncovers subplots, spin-offs, and tensions that are hard to contain in an overarching narrative. Polio highlights the manifold ways in which epidemic temporalities play out in treatment and prevention, on infrastructures, machines and bodies, societies and political frameworks. And as it pulls to a close, it seems that instead of an ending, the play moves on from the stage and as an experimental theater piece blends with the audience and continues long after the curtain is drawn. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, fascinating discussion of, of temporality and, and disease. Uh, I'd like to invite both of the speakers now to unmute their microphones and we'll go into uh, the discussion. So uh, please feel welcome to ask one another questions and have a, a conversation. And then uh, after a few minutes, maybe we can see it's three o'clock now and we wrap up at 3.30. So perhaps at um, maybe quarter after or a little bit before uh, we can turn, uh, open up the queue for questions. Yeah. So who would like to start? Go ahead. So Dora, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I can't believe we've been thinking about the same things on the same lines in the same ways. These narratives of of um, of how you know what characterizes a disease. I totally agree with you that Rosenberg's paper has been so influential. And at the same time, um, there are pieces I think that have been quite limited in helping us understand a lot of outbreaks of, of, of diseases uh, and particularly in pandemics. And so the, I wanna come back to COVID, but I wanted to say one thing about HIV. So the thing that has been most striking to me about HIV, and I wonder what you think about it, is it's, the end is a sedimentation in the poorest, most marginalized communities. And in those communities, it continues to rage it has all kinds of new narratives, new actors, new stages that it's being played out on, but not visible. And so, for example, I'm writing about African-American women with HIV in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and it was inevitable that HIV would spread from cities, cities like New York and Chicago and San Francisco into places in the South. But the rates of HIV in Atlanta among uh, uh, African-American women are as high as those uh, in, in some places like Tanzania, and it's completely invisible. And so that, writing about this and researching that, um, what's happening there, has made me really question this sort of the, the dramaturgical narrative that Rosenberg so gave us, and the many ways in which especially the end is problematic. So. So how do you think about, how, how did you become sort of uh, unsettled by the structure of this argument? Thank you. I, I, I would want to just, just uh, before we move on, so I don't forget, I was fascinated by when you were talking about this kind of very different but very similar questioning of the temporalities and these events and what it connects and what doesn't. So I, I would like to come back to that in a bit, but the way I got interested in this was exactly this moment where it was actually prompted by a, by a campaign poster where um, I think it was Bill Gates or Jackie Chan showing that we're this close to ending polio. And I had just done um, a few um, interviews with, with people living with polio. And you know, they were reflecting on how they call themselves, some of these people call themselves dinosaurs, as you know, leftover from an earlier era. Um, but also like it was definitely you know, there. And I was wondering with you, what is what is over and how does that disease you know, ch concept change? Is this still the same disease? And you know, it brought us with them all kinds of ways to think about this temporality. But I've been, I've been um, thinking a lot and writing with, uh, with Jeremy Green recently and you know, looking, at, I, I'm not even sure if I could name one disease or epidemic that fits the, the curve right. neatly. Exactly. Um, yeah. but, but it is a very, this is how we think about it. And this is a very powerful, so I think what Charles Rosenberg is doing is not coming up with some kind of false idea. It no. is how 
how how this works but it's um but but what i'm interested in is is you know the kind of uh, uh kind of work that that relegating something to the past or as being over it does and that uh, that is what fascinated me me and, and what you were saying of how using Tuskegee and using these past experiences is also creating that distance that, oh, it's not, you know, that is not happening anymore. There's highlighting the past exactly with the aim of, you know, nothing to see in the present. Right. Right. And so that, that is also, um, uh, I, think, I think, a very interesting point in that kind of link between the, the, the past and present. Yeah, so I think it, so. With respect to with respect to COVID, uh, I've been struck by the whole sense of um, it's certainly in the U.S. Uh, people and commentators saying, "Oh, it's going to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. It's going to be oh." And now the vaccines going to be ready. They're going to be vaccines ready in uh, December. They're going to be vaccines ready by by next summer. All uh, school children will be vaccinated, and it'll be over. And, it'll, and, and I'm thinking. Uh, I mean, first, this is one where this is an outbreak where we're many, many more people in a, in a given population are in it. We're all in it rather than there's, you know, it's not like in New York City where you could say, well, there's polio down in the Italian neighborhoods, right? But it's not on the Upper West Side. In this one, it's it's everybody's in it in the sense of, and I just have a sense of dread. I'm, I'm, I just keep going, it's not going to be over next summer. This is, I... And, and, and it sort of, you know, makes me, and I, I'm trying to think through my own experience of what an end means. Um, that, is, that is part of, of my uh, thinking through my own work right now. Um, so uh, I really appreciate it, um, the, the way you think about um, the, the kind of seductiveness of a notion that we're in a story that has a beginning and a middle and a neat end. Um, and I really wanted I really wanted to hear more about what you um, I like the roller coaster uh, <laughs> metaphor. And if you could say more about that. I I, I, I kept thinking about the about the curve um, of, of how Oh, you know, I'm so obsessively checking the, the numbers and, and there is this kind of statistical element to it that epidemiology becomes, you know, a popular science. I don't think epidemiology was ever so popularly embraced as uh, as now. And that and that there is, you know, that kind of sense that that it's getting worse, but but there will be a point of of uh, Getting over that, and, and that that it, that seems very very powerful for me as a as a, as a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. But it also that the kind of that the ending uh, issue also brings up, I think, something that historiographically happens after the end of these um, things, and that that you combine in in what what you're doing, um, looking at the, these um, vaccine trials and trying to figure out, you know, where these the the, the mistrust lays out. Is that once um, something is considered to be over or a history, there is the, the treatment part of it, which is you know when it's happening, and then there's the vaccine development part of it, uh, and the vaccination, which is sort of the marking the beginning of the end. And these are often um, discussed differently, uh, as this, uh, I mean, in different places by different people. Yes. Even though you know, as we can experience now they are happening in real time and they're very much connected because what your experience is, as you pointed out, the everyday experience in that, in that uh, uh, hospital environment or, or daily encounters with the general practitioner or primary healthcare physician will affect you know, the, the, the ways in which vaccine development is, is, uh, is, uh, is thought about, conceptualized, but also the way that it's practiced. So I was, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this connection and, and disconnect oftentimes between vaccination and treatment? Oh, I mean, I think about, I, I think about that a lot. Um, I, I've been sitting in various meetings and, and, and trying to be a, um, not just a historian, but a, you know, ethnographer as well, trying to understand the positions being taken. Uh, one of the things I was first struck by, I was in a meeting 
uh, at the National Academy of Sciences when uh, the chief uh, uh, executive of, Mod of Moderna, who just announced that they have a candidate vaccine that's supposedly 90 something percent uh, effective. Um, and the Pfizer people as well. And I'm listening to uh, a conversation that was really uh, complicated in the sense that they were arguing uh, about distribution, the distribution plans. And I think as we listen to this, we're gonna hear a lot of things that are gonna be both unsettling and familiar. Um, the, the question of who should get it first is now front and center, as well as this sort of new notion that the, the at least the pharmaceutical companies are promoting this new of uh, democratizing the trials, right? The, the people who participate in the trials. So they want African-Americans in these trials so that African-Americans won't feel uh, that they've been neglected or denied uh, the newest possible treatment. And then that gets translated into because African-Americans are disproportionately affected, they should get it first, which is beginning a kind of racializing of the vaccine. And then it's, to my knowledge, there's not a vac another vaccine that has a certain kind of racial valence to it that I've ever heard of. And so, uh, this, so this makes a problem. So this conversation is now the pharmaceutical companies representing themselves as the agents of, of, um, of equity and justice and uh, ethical behavior. And it's sort of shocking to sit and listen to that when we know, and they've put all of their corporate interests to the side as if, they, as if they're not gonna make an enormous amount of money uh, here. Uh, but now they're just good actors, good players in, in this situation. So I'm very struck by that. And um, I'm also struck about the fact that there are, uh, that people are beginning to have uh, discussions of lingering side effects uh, from uh, if they survive COVID, depending on the severity of their, of their um, illness. And then the last thing I just want to say, wanted to mention with respect to that is how cultural life is gonna change. A lot of women in the US, women in professional positions are stepping out of the workforce mm -hmm. because of what has happened to the educational system uh, and their inability to, uh, and, th and that they have to teach uh, their children at home. So young scientists in particular who are losing pretty much a whole year of research so far, and it could be longer and it might be longer, are uh, just stepping out and, and may not go back. And so this aspect of, of uh, the gendered nature and the class structure of it, meanwhile, working class women who um, have never had the benefit of, of systemic and uh, good childcare support are faring even worse. So it will, so the end will speak to a new position for women with respect to work uh, in certainly in US society and certainly it will be a differential impact across the country, different locales, different professions uh, and, and, and a lot of things, but, it, but there will be some profound changes associated with that. I'm also wondering if as, the, as this uh, long COVID uh, issue is, you know, as time passes and, and uh, and some of these um, uh, symptoms or, or condition or chronic conditions that arise um, manifest in greater numbers. If so, then you know that will compound the, the the situation even further because it will tend to be women who are either you know, the, the performing that kind of caregiving um, mm -hmm. work or uh, or they themselves are debilitated by that, so even less um, uh, um, able to, to, to go back to work. Yes, yeah. yes. absolutely. Um, and with our healthcare crisis, um, those long-term uh, effects uh, as a result of COVID illness um, might be re rewritten as pre-existing conditions, which will affect anyone's health care uh, insurance and, act, and therefore access to care as well. So the renaming of the long-term impacts of an infectious disease into not just chronic, 
but since uh, they occurred as a result of the pandemic, uh, there's, there's a kind of um, restructuring of the knowledge. Again, just as you described, a transfer of knowledge and a recategorization. Uh, you won't have COVID anymore. You, it's going to get named something else. I have no idea what the name will be, but it'll be something. And, and then it'll take on its own sort of character and become a different actor um, toward the end. But I'm also wondering um, uh, if, um, if this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, the, in, in this question of COVID because it's very difficult in point exactly, you know, what is the, the, the direct consequence of, of such a disease is also that, that is very new. And, and it does seem to come from patients themselves who seek you know, medical care. And that also has a very strong class element of who feels empowered to, to you know, um, make complaints about their life or accept and <laughs> move on with it, um, or who is empowered to, to articulate that. And, and, uh, and that, uh, I've uh, talked to, a, to an infectious disease doctor and, and it was, it, was uh, it, it came to the fore that it also tends to be women who are, um, who are complaining, making complaints. I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure if this would be representative, but it would be interesting to look into that kind of patient activism yeah. that, is, uh, that is pushing this, that has pushed post polio syndrome or has pushed you know, HIV research as well. If, if um, uh, what we're going to be seeing, but it's because it's so subtle and complex, it's a very complex disease with so many different symptoms. It's, you know, it's, it, I think there's that kind of activism and the way that that knowledge is created is going to be a very interesting process um, and very fraught process. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I, and I think that, uh, yeah, whose voices will be heard uh, here at, at the, in particular moments is going to be um, critical. Right now, there's deep concern about um, what's happening with uh, Latinx children that nobody can quite explain. There's so much we don't know uh, who is really going to be impacted uh, and affected long term. Um, and in the divisive politics of the US right now, uh, where it, this has been so thoroughly politicized as uh, around April when people were saying, well, that's what happened. When, when I, I, I was doing a webinar and I said, where I was talking about the disproportionate impact of, of, of COVID on African-American communities, which was read by one um, respondent, then that means that if I don't live in a neighborhood with African-Americans and I live far away from them, then it's never going to affect me. So I do not have to wear a mask. I do not have to social distance because residential segregation in fact protects me. And I, I was completely stunned by that, but it has played itself out in many ways subsequently. Uh, the, but now, uh, since the virus did just what we expected it to do, follow the humans and not care about the politics, uh, it'd be very hard for somebody to make that kind of, kind of argument. So that moment passed very quickly, but it was a, still a striking moment. Thank you both so much for your instructive and informative conversation today. We are really grateful for all of your contributions to the field and to have to extend this conversation here in Berlin, even though we're socially distanced and we can only be here virtually. Um, I just wanted to formally bring the session to a close and thank the audience as well for joining us today and taking some time from your everyday research uh, to get together. We'll see you next month. We'll be joined by Laura Koik and uh, Aparna Nair to talk about aging and disability and what that has to do with COVID-19 or what COVID-19 has to do with that. So please join us for that next session. And if you want to catch up with what you've missed, check out the YouTube links below here. All right, thanks again. And if you'd like to stick around and talk with our uh, presenters for a few minutes before we 
release them back to their duties, um, uh, please, please stick around just for a few minutes. Thanks a lot, everyone.